to Princeton, New Jersey. Today, we are going to be meeting with Miss Aggie in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hi, Gaia. Hi, Aggie. What's today's show all about, and who are the kids? The stars of today's show are Chad, Darren, and Anna. And they had to answer one question. Can man survive on Mars? How did the kids prepare for today's show? The kids first had to watch the movie, The Martian. I saw that movie. The main character was a botanist who became an astronaut, and he went to Mars. The main character was named Mark Watney. So kids, tell me, what was your favorite scene in the movie? My favorite scene in The Martian is when he blew up. Of course, your favorite scene is the one of Watney blowing himself up. Tell me more. How did Watney blow himself up? By mix, by he forgot to uh, mix something in with the, uh, the water that he was going to make. Nope. Mark Watney did something very unusual to get fresh water. They went to Princeton Satellite Systems to learn more about what Watney did. So they actually, he was using hydrazine. He was essentially using a rocket engine and the exhaust part of it is water. And that's how he was getting the water. But he was getting it directly from the combustion. He blew himself up once. And he did, because hydrazine is very, very dangerous. When people work with it normally, they have to wear full protective gear, because it's toxic. Three, two, one. It was like, whoa! And then he blew up. The big question is, can a human being survive on Mars? As you saw from the movie, The Martian it can be pretty dangerous. So I'd like to understand um, what topics, you know, of that problem are you particularly interested in? My topic was the desalination of water. What water are you talking about? Um, mainly the salt water, water, which can be found at the poles. Oh, okay. And there's also flowing water. How do we know there's water on Mars? I think you probably have seen this in the news. They have rovers on, on Mars. And, oh. and right? And the rovers took pictures of this. Gaia, can you tell me a little bit more about the robots and rovers that NASA sent? NASA sent a bunch of rovers to Mars, but I'll just talk about three of them. One of these rovers is named Curiosity. It's about the size of a car. Then there are two twin rovers. One of the twins is named Opportunity. And the other twin is named Spirit. Opportunity and Spirit are around 5 feet by 7 feet by 5 feet. NASA also sent things that are orbiting around Mars. They fly around the red planet. Surveyor and Orbiter are really cool. So I just wanted to show them to you. So Anna, can you tell me, how would you get fresh water without blowing yourself up? You could either dis distill the water, in which the water would evaporate, condense, and then fall back as fresh water. Mm -hmm. There's another way to desalinate water, right? It's called reverse osmosis. Anna, how does reverse osmosis work? Reverse osmosis is basically osmosis in reverse. In reverse osmosis, the water gets taken out through a series of vacuums and, and spinning chambers. After the kids learned about the two different ways to desalinate water, Kevin taught them about who or what could desalinate water on Mars. Kevin Peterson, I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Astrobotic Technology. And I set the uh, technical vision for the company and choose the technical strategy to meet our business objectives. Is it possible for a robot to desalinate water on Mars? It is possible for a robot to desalinate water on Mars, and it's probably necessary because you're going to have to have that water there when the ast astronauts show up. Water on Mars is uh, buried under the surface, uh, a lot of it. So there's a little bit of water that shows up in the form of frost, 
but a vast majority of it's buried underground. And that's actually true on Earth, too. Uh, so what you have to do is dig that water up, actually. It will be frozen. And then melt it. And then you uh, heat it up. You boil it like you would on Earth. And it, uh, it distill it. So um, just, like, just like you would with dirty water on Earth. Isn't Kevin dreamy? <sighs> Boy, heating water sounds like it needs a lot of energy. Where would you get the energy to power the desalination machine, and what would you do with the extra salt? From what I understand, it's a very energy intensive process. It's not an easy thing to do. Like any process that you need to do, any kind of manufacturing, you need the most efficient kind of power you can get. And what we're going to have on Mars, really, is the solar panels. So we need to have more solar panels. And of course, it depends on uh, how much water you want to end up with. If you have a few people, you need proportionately less water than if you have a lot of people. Now, what would I do with the extra salt? It does sound like it's a waste product. So it does sound like it's something that I'm going to find uh, a spot on Mars, like maybe behind the next crater, where I'm never going to see it. And I'm going to make a big pile of salt there. Now, someday, somebody who's very clever is going to come up with a use for all that salt. But when they do, it'll be there for them. So, Anna, since Gary said that desalination needs lots of energy, where will all this energy come from? My topic also relates to Darren's topic. My um, uh, focus was power slash energy. So we can use solar panels, methane, hydroelectric, and yeah. So in what way would you use those to survive? Methane is extremely flammable when it comes into contact with oxygen. That's why it's used in most homes for cooking, heating, etc. Is there oxygen on Mars? There is no oxygen on Mars whatsoever unless you create it. There's no oxygen. So how are we supposed to burn methane on Mars if there is no oxygen to make methane combust? Uh, you could use electrolysis. Since there's salt, salt water on Mars, we could just use that instead of putting salt into water. You need to form electrolysis to get oxygen? What's electrolysis? Kevin told the kids how electrolysis works. So let's take a look at what Kevin taught them. You put an anode and a cathode on the opposite sides of a water container, and uh, that will actually separate the hydrogen and oxygen from the, from the water. And then you've got your, your oxygen. How much energy do you need to perform electrolysis? How much power is used for the electrolysis? Electrolysis is a very energy intensive process, which is why we don't use it on Earth very often. It takes a lot of energy to electrolyze um, water to get oxygen. That's just great. We need lots of energy for desalination, and we need lots of energy for electrolysis. Where are we going to get all this energy? Kevin helped out with that question. Yeah, so, so you, you take solar and uh, you make a big voltage. Uh, so the solar power creates voltage, it creates current. Okay, solar. That sounds like a good and easy source of energy. Darren, please tell me there are no problems with solar. So the sandstorms are really bad for the solar panels. Sandstorms? That sounds just lovely. How are we supposed to get around that problem? Stephanie at Princeton Satellite Systems gave the kids great ideas how to work around the sandstorm problem. How do you plan on keeping the satellites slash solar panels clean? Solar panels mainly produce less power over time because the glass gets darker due to radiation damage. So the glass gets darker, so the panels produce less 15 years, when they're 15 years old, than they did when they were uh, new. They call that end-of-life power. So yeah, the dust that has to be brushed off on Mars, uh, you'd have to sweep them off, or maybe have a little, like a windshield wiper, swish them off. 
now and again, uh, right? It's automated, we did it every day, swish, or a uh, human being. Hey, Darren, I was just thinking, if there are sandstorms on Mars, that means there's wind. If there's wind, can't we just build windmills to generate energy? You can build one, but you need, like, titanium, uh, blades, a titanium pole, and a titanium base. So, in actuality, although the wind velocity could be high, like tornado velocities, the force is very small. So actually, the winds can be going very hard and you might not feel it that hard. Um, I think in the movie The Martian, in the opening, when they were walking through this terrible storm and there's uh, sand blowing all over, I think that may have been a little bit of Hollywood going on there. It's, you'd still have, it'd still be dangerous. But, um, I think uh, you c I could envision a windmill actually made of plastic, very thin material, but it would have to be very long, much longer than the ones here because the, air, the, the, the pressure of the air is not as much. Is it me or am I getting a sense that there's problems, 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 and more problems? There's also something else going on. It seems like there's some sort of connection between all your energies, Darren. In order to get energy by burning methane, we need oxygen. In order to get oxygen, we need to perform electrolysis. In order to perform electrolysis, we need energy like solar. What's the relationship between all the energy sources that can be found on Mars? So there is this thing that I got for Christmas. It was a Lego chain reaction thing. And that kind of reminded me of this. A lot. Mm -hmm. Anna talked about desalination and Darren talked about energy. Chad, what did you learn about? My topic was plants and how we can get them on Mars. My main plant that I researched was potatoes. Potatoes are a tuber. Tubers grow underground and rocks are really bad. Mars soil is of rock. What happens to potatoes in rocky soil? Uh, I planted the potato. There are rocks all around it. Mm. Around it. It will grow and grow and grow, but it will have to stop because of the rocks outside. So it will make it poisonous. Mars soil is very dry, and potatoes need moist, but not soggy, moist soil. Anna said her topic, desalination, is dependent upon Darren's topic, energy. How about you, Chad? Does your topic depend upon energy or desalination? It's all of our topics interconnect because I have to work with Darren for, pow for power and I have to work with Anna because fresh water that she produces. If, if you were on Mars yourself, would you, would you find it possible to grow uh, potatoes with the, with the things you mentioned? I wouldn't do that because A, A the temperature. Potatoes can grow at 72 degrees Fahrenheit to 42 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. but Mars can go to negative 142. 96% of the atmosphere in Mars is carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. so yes, that is good for plants, however, however, there is too much for it to absorb. There's one more reason, and that's sunlight. We get it's on sunlight, sunlight on Mars we get a lot, a lot of um, sunlight because of our place in the place in the solar system. Our solar system has eight planets and possibly a ninth. Mars is further from the sun than the Earth, meaning the Earth is closer to the sun. However, in the grand scheme of things, the Earth and Mars are both about the same distance to the sun. Remember, space is really, really, really big. 39 million miles is not much big of a difference. A Mars day is longer than an Earth day. Scientists call a Mars day a soul. So, Chad, since a Mars soul is longer than an Earth day, does that mean plants would get more sunlight on Mars than Earth? On Mars, you don't get enough. It's so cloudy. So it's not the sunlight, what you're telling me, is decreased due to like dust storms and things like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, those are very good reasons you gave. Thank, thank you. Uh, 
I worked hard to get here. Now to get potatoes to Mars, would they bring the seeds or would they bring little potato plants? How would that work? In the movie, The Martian, Mark Watney grew potatoes. Is that the best food to grow on Mars? Most scientists have worked with farmers to figure out that um, Mars soil is good for asparagus. Yes, kids, you heard it right. Asparagus is a good thing to grow on Mars. There's a rover called Phoenix, and Phoenix scoops up dirt. Scientists look at the data Phoenix got from its samples of Martian soil, and the scientists found out that Martian soil has minerals like magnesium, sodium, potassium, and chloride. These minerals are good for asparagus, green beans, and turnips. Do you like asparagus? Not necessarily, no. no. So in your, in your case, if you were on Mars and you were growing asparagus, I, I you'd mean, have some trouble with that. I'd eat it to survive, but I wasn't, but I wouldn't want it for dinner. Chad, is there anything else we would need to survive on Mars? Shelter is one of the main needed things for survival on Mars because without a shelter, you would be missing A, a place to sleep, um, B, B, a place to grow crops, because as I said, you need a base to grow a plant to keep in, C, to keep all of your machines, and B, and D, to hold power. Power. Uh, you, for, uh, yeah, and heat too. Why else would humans need a shelter for Mars? You also need it for oxygen, since there's no oxygen in Mars' atmosphere. You need a shelter that would provide oxygen, since you need to be able to breathe. So how do you get a shelter on Mars? Kevin had some great ideas on that. Let's take a look. This is a huge base, right? It's, uh, it's gigantic. You can see, I think this is an astronaut, and uh, there's an opening there. This is a lot of material. So this base has to protect all the people when they're there. It has to feed them. It has to house that water. And we understand how to do some of that from the International Space Station. But when you're, when you're building this thing, you have, to, you have to spend a lot of time on the surface putting all the building blocks together. You deploy robots that can do things like dig material, they can move pieces around, they might be big pallets with wheels basically, and then you land a bunch of habitat pieces, uh, you group them together, and the robots need to be able to sort of assemble all of those things. You can think of it like the robots are putting together these Lego blocks to build a base. You have to dig a foundation. When you build a house, you don't just put the walls up, uh, dig a big hole in the ground, sink the, sink the building into the ground. On Earth, we use concrete. There's different materials that, we, that you would use on different planets. Um, uh, the robot has to be able to place all of those materials in the ground. Uh, and then once the, once the robot builds up enough structure that it's safe for a person, then a person can come in and help. The kids talked a lot about the stuff we need on Mars to survive. Will our bodies be okay in the Mars environment? Lauren told the kids what would happen to human bodies on Mars. I'm Lauren Jones, and this is my friend Stan. <clears throat> I like to use Stan because it really helps people to have a better idea of their structure. It's much more clear. It's a full-size um, cast, and they can really come up and they can look at where their rib cage is or how a hand is structured. But we really don't work by stacking up parts. We really work as a whole. The poise of this head over the spine was like central control to movement. And it turns out it's not only in people, but in all vertebrates. You can tell about two thirds of the weight of the skull is in front of the spine and one third is behind, which leads us in a constant movement for a dynamic poise. That's a really neat part that we've been studying today, which is the anti-gravity system and the response and the belonging of human beings on Earth. We're about to look at what might happen if we were on Mars. Movement is not about a reflex. Okay. We have postural reflexes so that we stand up. 
But movement, I told you to go do something, didn't I? Didn't I? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had to plan that, didn't you? You ever think of that? Not really. <laughs> it's not a reflex. Movement involves planning. So when you're on Mars, what's going to happen to you when you step on the same kind of force that you're using on Earth? Because that's your habit. Well, the difference between walking on Mars and walking on Earth is you're going to be lighter. For our astronauts, as we talked about in our class, when they come back from outer space, their anti-gravity muscles have been fluffing off for a while because they haven't been exposed to Earth's gravity, which we are meant to be on. And they come back and they're a little bit like this. They, they drop a little bit. It's not huge, but we haven't had astronauts out there for 10 years, so who knows? What else could go wrong with human bodies when we're on Mars? We we'll probably need like a very protective spacesuit that would protect you from the atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, from the wind and dust storms. And it also has to be protected from radiation. Right. That's a very good point. There's, there's radiation all over the universe that can kill you in, in, in a few months. It's so dangerous. So if you're on the surface of Mars and you are not protected from the radiation, within a few months you could get cancer due to that. I see lots of problems with going to Mars. First, we need fresh water, which requires desalination of the salt water on Mars. That needs energy. To burn methane to get energy, we need oxygen. We need to perform electrolysis to get oxygen. We also need oxygen for breathing. It's really cold on Mars, so we need energy to heat habitats. Our bodies don't do well with Mars gravity, and there's radiation that could kill us. With all these problems, would any of you want to go to Mars? Personally? Yes. Well, a little bit, was, yeah. Well, listen, you know, keep in mind it to sort of follow up on her question. If you went to Mars, you'd be gone for two years. Is that something you want to do? I can live with it. You uh, wouldn't see your mom or dad for two years? I'd be fine with that. Well, <laughs> as long as they set up internet towers, we could video connect. I would... So you could Skype from Mars, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. I probably would pass on that because, well, first, it's a lot of training, and it takes a lot of time to prepare, and I'd be gone for a really long time, and if anything went wrong, that there would be a very high chance of me just like, no. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't see go. her. I wouldn't and go. I, I just maybe, go. But think of the amount of science that would go into that. You could, you would be one of the very few people who are going to experience Mars. Very true. But still, I would want to work for like the scientists on Earth who are working on that mission, or maybe you know even what? mission control. But otherwise, I don't want to be the astronaut that's actually going there. Good point. Mars makes Antarctica sound like a paradise. So Darren, why on Earth do you want to go to Mars? If we yeah, would Darren. come back, I could be a billionaire with mechanical wings. Oh, okay. Anna has changed my view. I probably wouldn't want to. No. I think one of the points brought up, I think Anna brought it up, it is a good one. Um, if, if you were to go to Mars, first of all, it's not even clear if the human body can survive for two years because you have to go six months to get there. You have to stay there for a year and six months to come back. So good, if anything went wrong in that time, anything, you're not going to be rescued by anybody. And your chance of survival, I think, is pretty low. For those who like exploration, like Darren, um, and he wants to be rich and famous when he gets back, that would be pretty exciting. Uh, but I think um, what Anna uh, and Chad mentioned, it'd be a little bit risky, and, and um, you're gone for a long, long time. Okay, folks, you heard it. Mars is not a bowl full of cherries. There's so many problems with going to Mars. 
Darren said there is absolutely no oxygen. There is no oxygen on Mars whatsoever unless you create it. But as Chad discovered and discussed, there is just a little bit. Hey kids, after everything we've learned today, can you tell me whether or not you and your family would like to go to Mars? Let's see how much you've learned by taking today's episode's quiz. Question 1. What could possibly hurt the human or squirrel body on Mars? Question 2. What would you eat? Question 3. How would you get fresh water? Question 4. This is the last question. What energy sources are available on Mars? Just go to www.kidsciencenews.org and click on the quiz tab.